The show always takes things to the next level for no reason at all. Hey loves, it's A back on your screen with another one. Hope you're all well. As you can tell from the title, today we're talking about Atlanta season one, episode nine, perhaps one of my favorites from season one. Watching this again six years later gave me everything I need. Donald Glover understood the assignment. This stands the test of time. There was so many themes and topics threaded through this that seemed like the basis for almost all of season three. So for those of you who felt like season three wasn't doing what it was supposed to, wasn't like the old Atlanta, come back and watch this episode specifically and then look at those ones differently. We're gonna get into it, I'm so excited. I hope you guys enjoy this review. If you do, you know what to do and let's go. So this episode opens up with Earn in somebody else's bed. How many times does this have to happen? Earn just stays being a hobosexual. Back in 2016, we didn't have a word for it, but today we do. And he's coming on strong with the whole staying in people's houses, maybe getting a little off the top too, in order to have a roof over his head. But what really tripped me out is when he woke up and he was struggling to put on his jeans. I said, who's texting him and why is he so rushed? For Van to be outside and see homegirl in the panty, hug him and kiss him as she locks the door. What was even more awkward than that was just before when the girl wakes up out of the bed, her back is facing her and she said, you're going to come back tonight? He says, no. He's still fumbling with his pants. A couple seconds pass. Thank you. Hobo sexual coming on strong. Beware, ladies. Watch them YouTube videos or those TikToks to stay away from men like that because this panorama has people out here acting like that heavy. Now we're in this awkward car scene and similarly to when we did the values episode. In this Juneteenth episode, they did so well of demonstrating the dissonance between all the characters, but especially Van and Earn, by having these quintessential scenes, like a car scene or a dinner party scene. So Van and Earn are in such conflict with one another that they fight over the window going up and down. At one point I said, this window's gonna jam. Neither you have money to fix this window if it breaks. I really felt for Van when she said, nope, the window's not gonna be down because it's gonna mess up my hair because my curls is the exact same way. Whenever in my friend's car, I said, sorry, I know it's your car, but these are my curls. And if we wanna get to point A and point B and I don't wanna look at the Lion King, we gotta roll up at least my side, okay? So I feel her, but I understand he was a little woozy. She asked if he was high. He said, I don't even know what he said, but it was giving barely. And I thought, dang, Ern is really living his best waste man life. It seems like the window is jammed at this point and they arrive at this elaborate, just beautiful, just opulent home. And who opens the door? On Viv, as we're gonna call her, cause that's who she is in Bel Air. Have you seen that series? It's good. If you really like it, I might do a season two review, but I ain't going back through season one. Cause that one, let's stay on track. More of the story is Aunt Viv opens the door and everything about her aura, the way she's dressed, the excessive accessories, just being so put together to the point where she was giving me politician vibes. You know that like fake trying to be for the people but you're not really on the same level and you wanna make sure you're not on the same level kind of vibe? That's what she was giving. Even down to the navy color of her dress, which really reminds me of politicians. What really got me when she started talking about the bathroom upstairs and over here and over here, and we have bathrooms on bathrooms and bathrooms. Like, okay, Oprah, you get a bathroom, you get a bathroom, you get a bathroom. This episode was awesome-ish from the very beginning to the very ending. Van gives Ern some attitude, well-deserved, tells her, do something right and get me a drink. So he goes over to the bar and he's trying to order vodka cran because that's what she asked for. Why does this bartender have so much smoke for Ern? First he says, get in line. There was just one man in line who was just taking his glass to go away. It wasn't that serious, homeboy. Ern tries to ask for the vodka crayon, a screwdriver, just something basic, bar rail. He hits him when we not have that. <laughs> he didn't say it like that, but he urged Ern to go and pick from the five on the list. And he's reading all of these drinks that are just poorly themed for Juneteenth, which by the way, before we get further in this episode, I gotta admit, I gotta be honest with you guys. This is the first time that I heard about Juneteenth. So whenever this aired in 2016, I did not know about Juneteenth until then. So watching this again and having done so much research over the last six years, it's so different knowing what I know 
because of the Atlanta show and also revisiting it and seeing it from that scope. They were really doing the most with all the names for those cocktails. He's like an emancipation eggnog, it's June. Like, I don't even think that's safe to have eggnog in June. While well, Ern is fighting with the bartender, Van is in the kitchen, and this is when Aunt Viv tells one of the servers, smile, this is not an orphanage. The, I need to breathe, cause that was so backwards. The irony of telling a black server to smile because it's not an orphanage during a Juneteenth celebration was giving me Massa says I have to behave a certain way in his house vibes. Like you might as well have just switched the script. And I want to ask you guys this. Would this have been as abrasive of an episode or would these characters be as irritating if Craig and his wife were alternate races if craig was an established black male who was so indulgent in the culture would we be looking at him sideways the same way and would we expect aunt viv to act the way she did if she was like the trophy white established wife atlanta does this often they did this twice in season three one of the most notable episodes was when they did the reparations episode and you just see what would it be like if this character was black instead of white and vice versa. It was very, very interesting. So go check my review and breakdown for that if you want to. So I was seeing the similar things in this episode too, because I was like, I don't think I would be, I don't think Craig would get under my skin as much if he was a black man, just really proud and profound about the culture. Whereas this Craig character is giving heavy white guilt tease, heavy almost as if he's trying to make up for his ancestors. But is that a bad thing? That's the question, because at least he has an awareness and he's taking action. This whole episode was get out before Jordan Peele dropped get out. Then she turns to Van and really dotes on her, raining praise. I don't know if it's adulation, if that's the right word, but she's really showering Van with praise. She's like, you're beautiful, you're intelligent, you're X, Y, and Z like me. I said she had to really bring it back to her, right? <laughs> <sighs> But it wasn't a lie and it really reminded me of the values episode when Van was talking to her friend across the table and she's like, men want what we have and who can be mad at that? So when you really pull it together, I was like, you know what? This episode really hit the nail on the head and it almost feels like it hit us over the head a little bit too much with this undercurrent of understanding your worth and just seeing how you're supposed to schmooze or read the room or move and operate. So she's telling her, you know, we have this person from this school if you wanna teach again, or if you wanna do this, or hey girl, you can be a housewife with your Ivy League husband. That one, two truths and a lie. We see Ern snooping around the reading study room of Craig and Craig sees him. He's like, oh, no, no, it's all good. It's all good, it's okay. This part gets me because Ern is looking at this painting like, sir, what is this? And I'm looking at it too. And I zoomed in and I know what I saw. And I just said, this ain't right. This ain't right for a homeboy to have in a study like this. Everything was just over the top, just extra. What really got me was when he quoted Malcolm X, I said, these words should not come out of your mouth. You are the last one to talk about freedom and taking because you're the reason why, not him personally, but the lineage and the history of America is the reason why a lot of people are still grappling with a lot of problems. Let's call a spade a spade. Another part that really got me, <laughs> guys, I can't. This Craig character was done to perfection. When he starts talking about, wait, are you from Congo, Cote d'Ivoire, this place, that place? Ern's like, no, this little thing called slavery happened, so I don't know. I said, Ern, I guess you can't afford 23 Me, let me stop. But even if you do know, do you really know? It's not the same as knowing, oh, 10 generations back, I'm Irish, or 20 generations back, I'm Portuguese, or whatever it may be. It's a little harder when you're an African-American finding your roots. A little harder, it's completely harder. As a Caribbean, I have a couple years of lineage, but then it gets a little wassy. That's a Canadian term. That's a Toronto term. <laughs> it gets a little weird when you go far back, because then you're, wait, wait, that person was, wait, what? I adore the dry humor that Donald Glover brought to these scenes because it was just perfect. It was the right amount of sharp tongue without being over the top. It was just stating what it is with such a flat line expression. Everything, just perfection. Fast forward a little bit, Van and Ern meet up and she gets mad at him because he's trying to leave and she's like, can you just do something for me? And they're like, wait, are these, are these serving food in miniature slave ship 
what what is going on here on this table? The next scene that is very notable is when they're sitting down with that author and she's talking about these three weird characters in her play that's a book that's becoming a movie and they have no interest in, in this. They're pretending like they're happily married. She thinks they're happily married. She's touching up his face. You know what's crazy? I've heard this before. Earlier this summer, I went to an event that was in honor of Toni Morrison and one of the authors that was inspired by her was talking about their book that happened during some natural disaster in I don't even know what city or country, but when they were describing it, I said, who sat here and thought of this? And this moment in Atlanta reminded me of that because I said, why does it have to be a gangbanger, a stripper and a pregnant lady? Like who comes with that? Ugh, but the weird people you meet when you're networking, let me tell you. Then the next person they meet is the pastor who's on some swindler type of time. I'm telling you, that's one thing that I really hope grows old because even as recent as a week ago. I don't know if you heard about the bishop that was faking his own hijacking situation. I don't know, there's just too much going on. And then there was a bishop before then that was caught swindling the situation and millions of dollars in the wall behind the toilet. Like, if you have been appointed by God, do God's will. Don't embarrass Jesus, please. So homeboy's trying to sell his money-making package to them while trying to compliment Van. And I said, why are all the people in this scenario super sketch? When I first watched this, I didn't take it in, but seeing where Van ends up season three, episode 10, this is devastating. They ask Ern, what do you do? He says, nothing. He's like, really nothing. And Van's looking at him like, are you serious? Then he starts this beautiful monologue about how Van does everything and without her, he's nothing. But what really got me is at the end, he says, I can't even imagine looking at another woman. Homeboy, you were just leaving some next chick's house this morning. So Van's like, I gotta go. Even though they offered her exactly what she needed, which is an in with the crew. She's in the washroom crying and saying he's so rude. And I remember watching this six years ago, like, what's the big deal? Isn't this what you wanted? It's obvious from the episodes leading up to this, she wants to have affection and acceptance and acknowledgement but i realize now looking back he was just saying those things and those are things he should say as she's the mother of his child but he don't feel like that and what's even worse what really got me is he told the three women she's okay van is not okay Van has never been okay as far as we know this character and it is devastating that he just took the knife and dragged it across why did you have to do that? You did more than what was required because you really wanted to rub it in that she's not your woman. That was just a different type of evil. Donald Glover really wrote his character to be an asshole, let me tell you. It took me a long time for me to take Earn from here to up here. We'll go through it as we go through season two. But that point and that moment hit different on second watch years later. It's a different type of malicious. It's obvious Van is flustered. She says, I'm gonna get drunk. That's when Aunt Viv pulls her away. <laughs> And then Craig pulls Ern away to do the slam poetry. Ern is sitting front row center like this, like, why am I here? He looks like he's about to drop. Like his facial expressions are insane. Someone spills a drink on him. Why does he smell and say, is that Red Bull? It looks like he's about to go to the bartender to give him the business for not allowing him to get something other than a signature cocktail. Just when two teenagers come up to him and say, oh, paper boy's manager, can we get a picture? One of them pulls out draws. It's like, why do you carry your sister's draws? You never know. I said, this show always think the show always takes things to the next level for no reason at all. It's so disturbing. All the commotion brings Aunt Viv and Craig out. And Craig slam, by the way. I want to erase all the words from my memory. Because having that man talk about Jim Crow being invisible. We didn't need that. I'm telling you, we didn't need that. And all the black people nodding their heads in the back should be ashamed for that. So when Craig comes out and he's like, what's all the commotion? And they realize that Earn is Paperboy's manager and cousin. The reactions, I'm telling you, if Craig was black and Aunt Viv was white, this would be a lot less just dissonant and very just stark and weird. Because Craig is like, oh, I've researched about you since Paperboy was underground and I heard about you from the shooting. And Aunt Viv is like, shooting you're not gonna shoot at this place that was such a sideward comment then she had to come in with her own alliteration saying trifling thugs and their family why girl no 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 we're gonna get back to the scene with her and van on the balcony at the end because i think that needs extra attention 
But what really got me about this scene was that Craig was more open and understanding and accommodating. And it really reminded me of the couple in the Trinity to the Bone episode where their son Sebastian was super open-minded. The mom was about taking the culture and the dad was at least open to indulge and getting to know the culture. Seeing this and seeing Aunt Viv's character just disregard the black experience say oh it's good to make something from rap and he's like it's bigger than that it's about family it's just not me making money from rap it just really spoke to how a lot of people whatever color maybe class transgresses that see certain establishments or modalities of culture as lesser than even though they hold weight and a lot of people make money off of it like craig said in the study there's a lot of commodification of rap and art and culture of blackness. And I think he indulges and hosts these events and tries to give back to apologize for that. And is it really wrong? Maybe the way he does it, like Ern said when he left, stop being so likable. Because at the end of the day, the crooks of that character, Craig, he is likable. At least he's trying, unlike these people who want to cancel CRT and just want to pretend like the history never happened, right? What's worse, because Craig is kind of gross exaggeration of what maybe black people would like to see in the States. So going back to a scene before then that I want to give special attention to when Van and Viv were on the balcony and they were talking about their husbands, it was so jarring. We know Van's not married to Ern, so having Viv say, oh, you did it the right way, you married for the right reasons, like homegirl, not even married. I don't even know if she said that knowing that Van wasn't married and just wanted to jiggy her with a knife one good time, or if the illusion of it all, she's so out of her mind. Because now that I look at Viv's character, it seems to me, like she's got the blinders on. And like I said, if she was a different nationality other than the black, would we really look at her sideways or expect that? That's what it's really giving. For Viv to reach this level of class and opulence and live this life and the money and have that husband who she's obviously a token black to finish his story. How does that feel? We don't often see that to story told. We see it the other way around many times, let me tell you, but it's not often from the black female being exoticized and commodified to add to the white male narrative. And I thought it was very interesting that they decided to do it that way. I think we would have looked at this and not batted an eye if the racism roles were reversed, but seeing Aunt Viv being so out of touch with the culture to the point where she's quoting Craig but Craig was quoting for colored girls when she said, you can't be black and sorry. I said, sis, everybody knows that's not his line. <sighs> At least he takes accountability for what he's taken from the culture where she's not even aware of her own culture. So what's worse? Because I could tell you, but it's up to you to share with me what your thoughts are. I saw Van seeing past the facade. I knew she knew it was fake, but I think she really went over the curve when she asked Viv, if she was tired of not being understood or having someone pretend to understand her. And Viv just swerved real quick because she's not in it for that. You can tell she's in for the image and the lifestyle. And that's fine, that's all right, I'm not gonna judge, but you can't get mad when someone is drawing from the culture if you're not standing for it yourself. June 19th of 1865 was when Texas received the Proclamation of Independence for Slaves. I haven't read up on it in a while. It still took some of the Southern states a couple years to get the memo. They pretended like they didn't know slavery was abolished, which is so horrible. And I think that further plays into the undercurrent of this episode. Is slavery really done when you see how Viv treats the server and how she treats the two boys that are trying to rub up on Paperboy's manager? Ern's like, no, 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 we're not having this. You're dumb, he's dumb, this is dumb. I'm tired of you trying to be like this about the situation. You're trying to be nice about it. I'm not here for it. And Van is so drunk at this point, she can't even contain him, but she makes sure she finishes her drink in that pretty glass before she leaves. Even when he's walking away, he's like, this is weird, this is weird. Because it was weird. The whole scenario was so off-putting. There's no way I could go to a party like that and just put on like that. I feel like not just Van and Ern were pretending, but everyone was just putting up a facade and I'm not here for that fake-ish. So I wonder what your thoughts are on this. Share it with me down below. Also let me know, since we're getting close to the end of season one, what your favorite episode was so far. Is it the one coming up? Was it one of the last nine? Let a girl know down below. And I hope you guys enjoyed this quick review. And until next time, stay safe, stay sane, stay blessed. Love and later.